Alleluia. Man ate of the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory be to thee. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. And many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place. The hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. And then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they, look, uh, they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today, Jesus tells the disciples, you give them something to eat. Dear friends in Christ, we live in a strange world. It's not strange to us because we're familiar with it. We're used to it. We've, we've gotten used to the smells and, and the feeling, and we've gotten used to something else, and that is scarcity. There never seems to be enough to go around. You talk about ends meeting, making ends meet, right? I didn't realize this until a few years ago that that talks about the, the end of the month lining up with the end of your paycheck, the ends meeting. Because if one of them ends too quick, you've got yourself a big problem. I guess if the other one ends too quick, that's a whole other deal and that's just fine. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about the fact that scarcity exists. We're talking about the fact that there is not, and there are not, infinite resources available to us. There are not enough hours in the day, it seems. There's never enough of us to go around. People make demands on our time. People make demands uh, on our, our resources. People make demands on all kinds of things that we have to offer. And there never seems to be enough. Now, I was about to say, there never seems to be enough vacation. <laughs> but our vacation was just the right length. If it would have been any longer, I think we would have run out of fun things to do. Well, that's not true, but we are blessed and glad to be back. It seems to us that things often run out. I said there's not enough hours in the day. Well, what about days in the week? What about weeks in the month? What about months in the year? And does it ever seem like there are enough years with those that we love? We had the opportunity this past week to uh, spend the night at my grandma's house in Wichita Falls. And as I hear her tell stories that I've heard a hundred times and a few new ones that I had not heard before, I was thinking about the text today. The fact that there never seems to be enough. That's the problem, isn't it? 
Jesus, his disciples, the apostles, the ones whom he had sent out, the apostles, they came back from driving out demons, from healing the sick, from preaching the good news of the kingdom, and Jesus could see the look in their faces. They were dog-tired. Jesus could see that there had not been enough rest and respite for them. Jesus could see that they needed a break. And so Jesus said, let's get in the boat. Let's go across the Sea of Galilee. Let's go across again to a desolate place for a while. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful vacation? Jesus says, let's go to a desolate place. It's the same word for a desert. (laughs) Jesus says, let's go out to the place where the people don't want to be so that you can recharge, so that you can get away from it all. Of course, it didn't work. As they set out in the boats, the people see that they're setting out in the boats. And, of course, on a clear day, you can see across the Sea of Galilee. And so they see exactly where they're going, and they say, well, we can just walk there ourselves. And so they actually beat them getting there. When Jesus and his apostles show up, there is this crowd. We find out later, 5,000 men, and I should always add, that doesn't include the women and the children who were also there as well. This crowd of perhaps as many as 10, 15,000 people were there. I don't know the last time that you were around 10 or 15,000 people, but I would remind you that the cities of LaGrange and Giddings are each at about 5,000, maybe six. So you're talking about the entire area here gathering together in one place, just like we do at Warda Picnic. <laughs> The entire community gathering together. And when Jesus sees them, he sees something that is, is very stark. It's, it's Jesus sees that they were there. He has compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were there, but they didn't know what to do. They were there, but they didn't know who was going to take care of them. They were there, but they didn't know where they were going to go or how they were going to take care of themselves. They only knew that where Jesus was, they wanted to be there. And so Jesus shepherds them. Jesus gives them to eat. You notice that he does this in a delegated fashion. It's not that Jesus feeds the 5,000, although he does. It's that the apostles feed the 5,000. Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat. And they say, Master, uh, 200 denarii, that's 200 days wages, two-thirds of a year, wouldn't buy enough to feed all of these people with even a morsel of bread. Jesus says, well, how many loaves do you have? They come back, five loaves, two fish, not a lot to eat. And Jesus commands them all to sit down in groups on the green grass, on the nice grass. In the midst of a desolate place, a desert, I don't exactly know where you find the nice grass, but Jesus knew a spot. So they sat, and Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, and he looked up to heaven, and he said a blessing. And then he broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. Now, you know the way that the rest of the story goes. You know this miracle. I'm sure you're quite familiar with it. They all ate and were satisfied. It's not that each one of them just got a corner of a loaf of bread. It's not that each one of them just got a a bite of fresh caught fish. But instead, they all ate and they were satisfied. And then, what's more, they took up 12 baskets full of leftovers, broken pieces, crumbs of bread, and pieces of fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Well, how does that compute? How does that make sense in a world where I just told you that resources are finite? Stuff runs out. Well, apparently not with Jesus. Apparently not when the Lord is our shepherd. It's the same Lord who is our shepherd, who in Psalm 23, King David, remember, writes that when the Lord blesses us, he sets us a table in front of our enemies and we have nothing to fear. 
Because we've walked through the valley of the shadow of death and God has already comforted us. Now we can be surrounded by enemies and we've still got nothing to fear. God will bless us. How does David put it? He says, you anoint my head with oil. That means I'm your chosen one. And then he says, my cup, I'm going to do the King James because I like it more. My cup runneth over. My cup overflows, if you need the more modern translation. What it says there is that God doesn't just stop blessing us whenever our cup is full, but instead he satisfies us and there are always leftovers. There's always more than we can handle. There's always more joy than we could have even anticipated or expected or asked for. That's the joy of the Lord. That's the way that Jesus chooses to shepherd us, his flock. And we hear about it in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, in our Old Testament lesson for the day. Um, God looks out upon the pasture. He looks out and he sees his sheep. He sees those who have been shepherded by, by false shepherds, by false prophets. Those who have been scattered after the way of this world. Those who have bought in not to the, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but the ways of the world. And sometimes that's a temptation for us as well. It's a temptation for us to look at the world through finite resource glasses. It doesn't roll off the tongue like rose-colored glasses, does it? And yet these finite resource-tented glasses show us that what we have, well, we ought to take care of it. And I'm not just talking about being good stewards of it, but I'm saying we ought to squander it. We ought to hold it to ourselves. We ought to make sure that none of it slips out of our control. You have the opportunity to be a blessing to someone. No. I don't know when we're going to have a rainy day. Or in central Texas, I don't know when the rain will stop. And I might need that money. I might need that, that extra resource that I'm holding on to for that time when everything dries up. There's a word to be said here today about trusting in the Lord. Not just looking to our own understanding, not just looking to our, our own uh, financial or our own uh, stewardship in terms of the way that we think that things ought to work, but instead, instead trusting that God will provide. Instead, looking to Him as the one who doesn't just give us what we need, but He gives us more than what we need. It's true for each and every one of us. No matter what circumstance in life you find yourself, whether you've gotten that diagnosis or whether you're going through those treatments, or whether you're, you've got a loved one who's in the hospital today or whether you are in the midst of, uh, of a boom in terms of your own personal finances, your own personal life, God gives us more than we could ever ask for, more than we could ever deserve, certainly more than we deserve. He has blessed us with this very day. A day in which you, dear friends in Christ, are reminded once more that your sins are forgiven. A day in which our Lord himself bids you to come to this table and to feast upon his own body and blood so that you may receive the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Dear friends in Christ, ours is a God who has done more than we even needed him to do. It takes a bit to wrap your head around. I'm still working on it myself. The fact that when Jesus went to the cross, not only did he die for every sin that I ever have committed, but he died for all sin. He died for every sin and even more. Even the potential sins that haven't become a reality yet. That's the love that God has for us in Christ. That Jesus would come and that he would see that apart from him we are like sheep without a shepherd. That we need him. That's why he built a church like this. That's why he called our forebearers in the faith, those whose shoulders we are privileged to stand upon for just a little better view. That's why he sent them to this little corner of creation that we call Warda. That's why there is a church here. We just sang the hymn, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. Jesus is the one who builds a church so that the sheep 
who are scattered throughout this dark world filled with wolves and thorns and thistles, that we might come in and that when we're here, we might be fed and tended to, nourished forever. And when we go back out of those doors, you better believe that we're taking baskets full of leftovers with us. You better believe that we're going out to that place to a world of of lost sheep that don't even know that they're lost because after all, sheep aren't that bright. And when we go, we get to feed them in turn. Jesus says to his apostles, his sent ones, you give them something to eat. Your friends in Christ, that's our calling too. Give them something to eat. I don't know that there's a better mission text out there. You give them something to eat. So dear friends in Christ, that is my prayer for you this day and always, is that as we leave this place, we would actually leave this place changed, converted again. We would actually leave this place filled with forgiveness and overflowing, runneth thing over? I don't think you can add I-N-G to runneth over. Our cups overflowing. Because the world out there needs what's going on in here. The world out there needs to know that there is a Savior from sin. That whatever the world tells them, uh, whatever the world tries to convince them they are, which, first of all, is people of finite resources. Only so many more days, weeks, months, years left. Only so much more money in the bank account. Only so many more steps where you need to get a knee replaced or a hip. Dear friends in Christ, we know no limits. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, he has called us to be people of immortality. The world doesn't get it. And that's why Jesus tells us, you give them something to eat. And the peace of God which passes all understanding may guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until the day when he does come again in glory.